So in that, and I kind of give that challenge of like, who's, who's stirred up by what are we doing as a church? Who is Midtown becoming? What are we participating in? What are the things that we see God doing that we are um, essentially partnering in? And so I hope that stirs you up. I, I wonder if there's another part, though, as you just hear Laura, Laura and the transformation that she's seen in her own life over this last year in her work, I wonder if this stirs anything up for you in your work, like your J-O-B, the, the thing that you do about a third of your entire life. I mean, it's probably equal to sleeping, and then you try to find time off, and some of us overwork and do too much, and some of us maybe don't work enough. Anyways, um, there's like pieces in this, but like I wonder, like, what's going on in your work, the, the thing that you do? And this is also across the board. This is across the board for stay-at-home parents. Like, that is work. There are some who are trying to find work right now, and trying to find work is work. There are those who have disabilities that could keep from, you know, actual eight to five hourly work, but there is work still to be done. Like, we, we all have these aspects of work, and there's physical things that we'll spend a third of our life working. I don't know if that's an encouragement or a scary thing for you right now. Um, but then there's also the mental and emotional side. How much of your stress comes from work, and specifically maybe finances? The, the, the mental, emotional turmoil that you find yourself in, how much of it is week in, week out because of your work? Whether it's just a very hard, stressful job, or whether you just feel unsettled and, and discontent with the work you do, and just the, the stresses that can, can consume us. So not only are we talking a third of our life physically, but how much more does it take up inside of us in and around that? So I, I, would, I would question this morning, like as Laura talks and all that she's doing in her job, in her work, how are you doing in your work? How are you doing in your job? How are you doing in finding work? And I think for us, and what I would say as followers of Jesus, so for, for us as the church, there's an aspect in this where oftentimes we can get to this idea that I have my job, but then I have like my spiritual life. And like, I show up from 8 to 5 and I do this thing, but then I'm this person at church on Sunday. Or, you know, I, I will show up and do my work here, but the real work is really like the church stuff and like the kingdom work, and my job isn't really that. And there's a long history in so many ways of our culture of a secular and sacred divide, where there's this idea of there's all these holy things that we can do as people, but then there's just like these worldly, secular things. And I would say right now, I don't see that in Scripture anywhere. I don't, I don't see a divide that says, this is the work to do. Because oftentimes we can get this idea that, man, the missionaries, like if I could, if I, when I retire, and I can just go across it, like then I can really start doing some work. But man, I just got to put my time in my job until I get to that point. Or like, man, I, I, I will work hard so that this weekend I, I can go and actually do some good stuff or just not work. Like, I, I don't know, maybe it's just that I just live my life working and then being like, I just can't wait for the weekend. I'm guessing there's a few people that resonate with that right now. But what can happen then is we as followers of Jesus can show up in the workplace and we have like our bumper sticker and, you know, we like tell people really how we should be Christians and all these things. But then like we don't follow through on our work. We lie to get ahead. We gossip around the water cooler. And all of a sudden like we're talking about this Christian life or this, this thing that we, you know, talk about in life with Jesus. But then we're kind of living this other thing because again, like here's my Christian life over here. And then here's work. And, and those are two separate things. And as I read the scriptures, as I look at the life of Jesus, I just, I don't see this. I, I, don't, I don't see this divide in any way. And it's hard because like, I mean, as you think about all the people you work with, if you don't know the bumper sticker person, you know what they say is like, if you don't know the other person, it might be you. So just a heads up, like just, yeah, check the back of your car, see what's going on there. Um, we're continuing a series, uh, and just pray for me as I try not to go too long here. Um, more. This idea that, like, God is doing more in everything in our lives. So last week we explored identity. This week is work. We'll talk about relationships, and then we will talk about weekends. Uh, look, Lila's going to wrap us up with that. It's going to be fun. Um, but this I thing of, like, like, we live this life as followers of Jesus where we're still involved in the everyday rhythms. We're, we're, it's just all the normal, oftentimes mundane things and the question is, like, is there more to this? Or is it just clocking in and out? Is it just waiting for the time to go by? Is it, hey, I can do the things I want on the weekend? Hey, I can have this life of impact once I retire. 
and we go down and down the list. Like, can we find more in these things? And can we look to what God and his spirit are up to in and around those? I can remember in college, um, Caitlin and I had been dating, uh, and I really had gotten to a point just before that, like, I want to start following Jesus. And life starts changing in ways. I move out of the apartment I was living in with uh, teammates of mine, and uh, I start checking out churches. Caitlin and I, we go to a couple different college groups, and there was a guy, I remember, his name was Richard Jett, and he was the college pastor at this massive church. And we hung out a few times, and he's like, hey, man, can I take you to lunch? And I'm still in, like, this dual life type thing, like, showing up to church on Sundays, but, like, this is my life of athletics and partying and all that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I, I guess. Like, feeling like I'm just going to walk into this thing, and I'm just going to be exposed. Like, this is, this is not going to, like, you don't know who you're asking to lunch right now. And so we go to lunch, and we're hanging out, and just, like, for, like, almost two hours, he just speaks, like, encouragement over me and, and things that he sees in me that I couldn't see myself. I, I had no idea the things that he was calling out in my life. And I don't know about you, but I can, I can imagine a number of people in my life like this. And I can go back and I knew Richard Jett. Literally, I think I saw him twice after that lunch. Like he moved to go be a fireman somewhere. Like, that's my only interaction. But there's this moment where he's calling more out in me. And I think that's what Paul is doing in this letter to all the Christians in Ephesus, the city of Ephesus. He's actually saying there's more. There, there's more to the life that you are leading. Whether you are in, like in Israel and you're part of the Jewish faith and you're part of the people of God, or if you're on the outside as a Gentile and you're being invited into this thing, there's, there's more for everybody. And Paul is a richer jet in the sense to say, there's so much more in your life. And this morning I want to say there's so much more in your work. There's so much more than just showing up eight to five. There's so much more than just putting up with your boss. There's so much more than participating in just the, the anxiety that's going on in your workplace. There's so much more than just waiting to retire. There's so much more. So Paul in Ephesians 4, he starts talking about this new life that Gentiles, those outside of the church, can have in Jesus. He starts talking about uh, the grace that, that can actually open up that they've been invited into. And what starts to happen is people start to identify the gifts that they have in them. The things with, that they can actually contribute to other people and they can start to unify this divided church because everyone's coming together from these completely different lives, culturally, ethnically, religiously, politically. I mean, you, you name it, they are different in this room. But he's saying the things inside you, the, the work that you can do will bring more to your life and to others than you could ever imagine. He says this in uh, 4 verse 28. Or sorry, 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance and this is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. He continues in verse 20 that however, it is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. I think about Laura talking about this last year and the transformation that was happening within her. In the most challenging year, oftentimes we can look outward and think of all the things that should fix around us and should become better, but oftentimes it starts within us. And Paul is saying, you've been called to something new. You can drop the old things that are not leading to life and you can step into newness. You can step into more. And then he continues in 28. He starts to give these instructions of as that's falling off, here's a way to live. And he says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. That right there will push against our culture of living for the weekends of can't, waiting to retire, of this sacred and secular divide. Paul right there says, work. Do not go about your life stealing for selfish ambition, but work. And then that work actually leads to other people's lives. That you are now working for more than just yourself. So this morning, when you think about your work, are you working for just yourself? And there's metrics that can be helpful. We can think of, am I just working so that I can make more money? Am I just working so that I can have that vacation? I'm just working so I can get an earlier retirement. Like, what is your reason for working? And maybe you find yourself in a job that you hate. Maybe you find something you don't like. Maybe it's things that have been passed down to you. 
It's the story of your family that has said, this is what our family does. This is what it looks like to be successful in life. This is the way which you will find true life if you have this career. I've landscaped front yards in the middle of summer. I have signed a professional contract with a professional athlete. Everything in between, your job will fall short. Some of you are in a job that you love, and it aligns with your gift mix. Psychologists call this flow. There, there, there's a thing that within you, like you're just, you're in it, and it's rhythmic, and it feels good, and it brings life. And like, I, I think like that can be a thing. I don't know if everyone finds that, but that can be a thing. But it takes this work of understanding what God is doing in you, and oftentimes that flow, what they'll say is it contributes to you actually working for more than just yourself. It's a major aspect of flow, that at least 20% of your work is actually spent to the things that you find meaning in. All the research will show. You talk about the Pareto Principle, where if you, if you do 20%, the, the 20% that you're good at, that'll produce 80% of the results. And over and over again, we can find this flow, but oftentimes we don't. And at the end of the day, though, no matter if you find that flow, your job will fall short to find meaning and purpose and belonging and all the things that come from that. Because the deeper part of what Paul's getting to is he is talking about work. He's saying, stop stealing, do work. And then it moves to others. So there's a part that says, stop stealing, grow in generosity. Stop living a selfish life that is self-seeking in all the things that you are doing and start looking at how it's contributing to the lives of others, the things that you were meant to live for. Because it's in the work that you do that we'll see the kingdom start to operate. It's in the work that Laura is doing within Heaton Elementary School at what has been historically one of the lowest rating schools in our city. Because in this idea of stealing and even in the ideas of our city, there are systemic issues that we will continue to run up against. People don't always just steal because they want something of others. Oftentimes it is out of desperation. And oftentimes that is out of the social structures that we have in life. But either way, Paul is saying, stop living just for yourself. Your work can have so much more meaning because it actually contributes to the lives of others. And it's not just showing up eight to five to punch a clock. It is also identifying the work that God is doing in you and the giftings that he has given you. And for some, you can feel stifled because you're doing things that do not align with that. But that doesn't mean we just errantly walk around and hate our job and just can't wait to get to the next thing. Because you've also been called into a new life to then give to others. So when you're at a job that you do not like, who are the people that are anxious which where you can bring peace? When, when, when you're trying to figure out and maybe there's a transition coming or you're desiring a new job or maybe you are to take that promotion, whatever it is, who are the people that are feeling lonely and isolated in and around your work that you can bring friendship to and belonging? And sometimes we can get caught. I can, I can think, man, even as, as a pastor, like, well, I'm doing this work and, you know, it's, it's the church and blah, blah, it's all good. But at the same time, those of us that find ourselves in work that's naturally for other people, we can still miss out on transformation. There's a gentleman who started, Bob Pierce, he founded World Vision. This is one of the largest uh, Christian relief organizations that we've ever seen, still continuing to this day. And Bob Pierce had a deep desire for people who had needs, for those needs to be met. I think kind of his, his main line was, just let me burn out for God. Like, just let me burn out. I want to see all these needs be met. And on the way of doing that, his life absolutely fell apart. His marriage absolutely fell apart. His kids' relationships absolutely fell apart because people would say he is a man restless to win souls. I have never met a person with greater compassion. He is a true Christian Samaritan who literally laid down his life for the needy little people of the world. Let my, and he would say, let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. While so much of that is true and so much of that is good, he wrecked the lives that were he was most closest to. He abandoned his kids when they needed him most, one even getting to a point of taking their own life. But you could see it's world vision. Of course, that's good work. Let me burn out for God. This is so hard. Just because we line up with work that is doing good doesn't mean that we are actually becoming good while we're in it. And then those that are in work that's just hard and challenging. Now, here's, here's the hard part is that this is, a, again, understanding the sacred, secular divide. There's not jobs that mean more as a Christian. Like, once I find this thing and I'm in this Christian job, I'll tell you what, sometimes those are the worst work environments. Those can be horrible. 
right? But we can try and find this perfect job, and you know, I'm a Christian, these things. And it's like, no. If you're called to be in finances, be in finances. If you feel called to be in education, be in education. If you, whatever it is, like step into that realizing that there is not this divide and that Jesus and his kingdom are showing up with you to work every single day to do something more than you could just do by yourself by punching a clock. So much more than you could ever imagine. Here's just a quick little image. Something that our, our world and especially our culture just holds so high. If you can figure, just if you look at like a 60 hour a, a, a week business person that is a mover and a shaker and they're just crushing it and they know everyone in town and they're doing all the things and they have the nice stuff and they're just going and going and going. And, and they, they are a follower of Jesus and they're doing you know, all these good things. And then you have a 40 hour a week mechanic who's just putting in the hours. And while the one who's doing all this stuff is running around doing all these things, the mechanic is like loving his wife and just spending time with his kids, has a few good friends that he knows and knows him, while the one moving and shaking just knows everyone on just this surface. I mean, you have these two scenarios. Who's becoming more like God? Which one does our city need more of? Someone who has just slowed down and seeks Jesus' presence and is intimate and deep with the relationships around, or is it the ones that are trying to move and shake and conquer everything? Which ways in your job are you seeking self-satisfaction? You're seeking the next thing. Is your job just a means to an end for you? Or is it a place in which you can actually engage others and bring about Jesus and his kingdom? Should I say be aware of what Jesus and his kingdom are up to? Teachers, literally educating the future of our world. Social workers, providing safety and confidence for people marginalized. Government and law enforcement, trying their best to put structures in place that give us something that we can actually hold to and live half-decent lives. Finances, actually keeping people from predatory practices and putting margin in so that we do not have more financial crashes. A barista, man, smiling and bringing the gift of hospitality so people see seen that morning. I mean, you go down and down the list. Every single thing we can contribute to what the world needs most by what we could deem our ordinary, everyday jobs. It was believers who started the first hospitals. It was believers who started the first education system. It was Quakers that came up with the price tag because they had committed to not lying. And when you can haggle over price, people can take advantage of and lie. I mean, you go down the list, like this is, this is actually a secular and sacred bridge. All of these things. How does your work right now bring dignity and hope to the world? And I'm not talking about the job that you clock in and out of. How does your work, you personally, the spaces that you inhabit in and around your job, how is your work bringing about dignity and healing, and purpose, and redemption, and peace, and love into our world. I'm going to show us this, and then we will we'll stand and pray. Um, finding your why. Uh, some of our leadership just worked through this recently. I think a part of it is that we don't oftentimes know our why. Simon Sinek writes about this. He has a number of books um, on how we can step into meaning and purpose, and how we kind of organize how we go about those things. And finding your why is a few things here. It's the purpose, the cause, or belief that drives every organization and every person's individual journey. Like when you know your why behind something, it can actually give alignment to moving forward. Why does your why exist? Why did you get out of bed this morning? Why should anyone care? I mean, you keep going on and on and on. And it goes like this, to, so that. So two is the contribution that you are giving to this world. So that there is an impact that flows. And we'll have it here on the screen, and it looks just like this. It's very simple. Two and so that. Here's a couple examples. Two, inspire people to do the things that inspire them so that together we can change our world. To empower and educate people everywhere so that they can improve their lives and achieve their goals. This was mine, my draft as of a month ago. To create meaningful context and relationships so that more people can experience transformation in Jesus. See, there is no perfect job, but if you can understand and receive the why that God has put on your life, 
No matter what job you can find yourself in, you can participate in what Jesus and his kingdom are doing. But to go back to our why, what has God called you to? What are the giftings he has inside of you? What's your story that contributes to who you are today and how does that look outwards to other people? And then you take that why wherever you go and that is the work that you are contributing to that looks out towards others. So I want to do for a second, I'm going to ask LJ and Rachel to come forward and I'm just going to leave this on the screen and I'm going to read um, just in silence and then we'll enter to a time of uh, music here. But as you're looking at this, I'm going to read the first part of Ephesians 4 that we did not read. And just hearing these words, I just want you just to be open to what Jesus might have for you. And maybe take this with you to so that. Take it from here. Go look it up. I'm not going to break it all down. Look up Simon Sinek. To so what? Or maybe it's just a simple purpose statement. But I just want you to look at this and just reflect. What is your two? What is the thing that you contribute to? What is the thing that you feel God calling you to do? And this can be transferable among, among all spaces. And then what is it actually resulting in for other people? To do this so that others can. So as you look at this, I'm going to read, and then I'll invite us into some ministry time. Ephesians 4 says this. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and one Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As each of us in this room, as each of us online, do our work. So what is your why? To do this so that others can. What is that?